Well, we are in the midst of a message series that I'm calling uh, Journey to the Cross. Now, I call it Journey to the Cross for a lot of different reasons. Uh, most importantly, it's the, we are in the time of Lent where we, we are moving closer and closer to the time uh, where Jesus was on the cross and he died on Good Friday only to rise again on Easter. And that is a good journey for us to take. Uh, but also, we're taking a look at Jesus' own journey to the cross to see him differently, to see him in his fullness, to see him in everything that he is. Honestly, there are many times times where so many people just see Jesus as a real good guy. But what we've been doing is been taking a look at Jesus in all of the different aspects of who he truly is. And in the process of that, I would hope that we would know him more fully and completely. Because, you know, in many ways, this is our journey to the cross as well. In many aspects, this is us getting to know Jesus even better and get closer and closer to the cross of Christ. So as we've been uh, going through this message series, we've been taking a look at many different aspects of uh, Jesus's journey to the cross and knowing him more completely. And today we're going to be taking a look at Jesus as the healer. Now, when we think of healing, um, I'm not sure what goes through your minds, uh, I know what a lot of mainline churches have a tendency to think of healing ministries as uh, supernatural ministries like this with a bit of suspicion. And frankly, there are a lot of misconceptions around what, what you see as, as healing in today's culture. Uh, we often have some misconceptions around what that whole thing means. And unfortunately, if we allow those misconceptions to build, what we end up doing is we end up building our walls up so we don't see God in all of his fullness, in all of his majesty. We don't get to see Jesus in his completeness. So far during this message series, we've talked about several aspects of Jesus. First of all, we've talked about him as a teacher and how his teachings are absolutely essential. We've also uh, talked about uh, Jesus in his role as a prophet. And as a role as a prophet, he spoke uh, the word of God with everything that he said. Last week, we talked about Jesus as the high priest and how he literally made the ultimate sacrifice on our behalf. And today we're going to be talking about Jesus as healer, understanding that healing comes in many different ways. And we just need to keep our eyes open to understand what that's all about. Well, first of all, let's take a look at Jesus as the great healer. Before we get too far in this, I just want to uh, try to dispel some misconceptions right from the very beginning. Before we get into this, let's try to you know, break down any barriers that are out there. I know that there are a, a lot of uh, Christian faith healers out there that, in my opinion, have a tendency to drift far from what the Bible is really talking about. For instance, there are a lot, of, a lot of people who, when they pray over you and you're not instantly healed, it's so easy to blame you, to say, you must not have enough faith. I don't see that anywhere in Scripture, and we're going to be talking about that a little bit later. A lot of people say that they have the power to heal, but I tell you, the only one who heals is God himself. All we can do is ask. All we can do is pre as precious children come before our Holy Father for him to do a good work. This is never about us. It's not about us in the very least. It's not about us and how much faith we have. It's not us, uh, the people who do the praying. It isn't the prayer itself. The prayer itself is just us asking God. It is all about God himself. And if we can really get into our minds that when we're talking about healing, we're just simply talking about a movement of the almighty Lord of the universe then we can back off on a lot of things that somehow don't seem to be right. Just because they're done a lot doesn't mean that it's working necessarily for God. I'll talk about these as we go along, but I just want everyone to understand that that's what we're talking about when we're talking about healing. For instance, we need to take a look at how did Jesus heal in the past? In other words, when uh, he was walking on the earth in the New Testament era, what kinds of healings did Jesus do? 
Well, I tell you, I'm not going to give a laundry list because there are far too many. So I'm just going to give a little cross section. He healed the blind. He caused those people who couldn't walk to walk. He healed those with leprosy. He healed those who were hemorrhaging for years. He healed a man whose hand was all withered and made it whole. He raised people from the dead, which, by the way, when he raises people from the dead, that's not the resurrection. That's just being healed after being sick for a very long time, if you know what I mean. I mean, really, really sick. There have been so many instances of Jesus healing throughout the entire New Testament uh, that one of the authors said, hey, there's too much. Jesus did so many things, I can't even fit it in this book. So the issue at hand here is not whether or not Jesus did It's in what ways, how, what can we learn from that? What can we take away from all of that? One of my favorite stories, one of my favorite stories about Jesus' healing is about blind Bartimaeus. Anyone remember the story of Bartimaeus? This is a great story. I bet you do. Thank you very much. This is a great story, and uh, it's a great story for many reasons, but this is how it all starts. Then they came to Jericho, and Jesus was a deci- Jesus and his disciples were gathered together with a large crowd and leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus, and I just love this translation. Can you read it from here? It says, a blind man, Bartimaeus, and in parentheses, which means son of Timaeus. Well, bar, just simply, that prefix bar refers to son. So bar Timaeus, by, by its very definition, is son of Timaeus. Um, he was sitting by the roadside begging. So here we have a blind beggar sitting on the roadside. And then somehow he hears that it is Jesus in this whole crowd. And then he begins to shout like this, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many in the crowd rebuke him and tell him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more. And he said, son of David, have mercy on me. I'm glad I'm amplified. I hope you could hear that from the back row. But you know, I want to give you the I want to give you the impression of what really happened. This man was crying out for Jesus. He was doing everything he could to be noticed by the Savior who was walking by. Now that's very important as we continue on with the story. Jesus stopped and called him. Or Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So uh, they called the blind man and said, cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. So he threw his cloak aside and jumped to his feet and went over to Jesus. Now, I really get a kick out of this. In fact, when I was in seminary and I read this uh, to really rip apart the meaning, this bended my head. It gave me a headache for weeks. Listen to this. What do you want me to do for you, said Jesus? You see, that's what the Bible said, right? So let me ask you this. Do you think Jesus was seeking information? Here comes a blind man saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Do you think Jesus didn't know he was blind? I don't think so. Do you think Jesus was seeking information because the person uh, may have been saying, Jesus, son of mercy, our son of David, have mercy on me. I stubbed my toe on a rock. Do you think he was was confused at some point? Most likely not, considering Jesus was omniscient. He knew everything. So why did he say, what would you like me to do for you? And then, of course, he replies, Rabbi, I want to see Now, in my own mind, I just see Jesus looking at him. Oh, what can I do for you? Oh, you want to see? And give him a little short little smile and says, Yeah, go. Your faith has made you well. You can immediately see. I think the real issue behind this, okay, this is a complicated bit of theology, but you guys are smart. You can track this. He said, your faith has made you well, or your faith has healed you in this translation. Here's where some people have twisted that around to say, you personally need to have enough faith as you're being prayed over. But that's not what Jesus was saying. 
Jesus was saying, it was your faith that made you well because you cried out for me. Jesus is saying, you came to me as your healer. There's only one, there are two instances where Jesus said, your faith has made you well. This is one, and the other is a woman who had hemorrhage for 12 years, and she fought her way through the crowd, thinking, if I can just touch the hem of his cloak, I will be healed, and he was. In both of those instances, it was not that they're laying there with their hands open, waiting to be prayed for, and Jesus says, sorry, I can't do anything with you. You're just, you just don't have enough faith. What they're saying is, they're faith enough to seek Jesus Christ. That's what made them well. Not, not their faith, but their action motivated by faith. I got to tell you, there are a lot of people, and I'm not saying the majority, but there are a lot of ministries out there that make a big deal about healing, and they try to cash in on it. Please understand that a few rotten apples don't spoil the gospel, amen? One time, and believe me, I've seen, I've seen these, these people throughout my entire ministry, but one example came to mind so clearly is I was living in St. Cloud at the time, which is a fairly large city, and this guy came into town and threw up all kinds of posters saying, signs, wonders, and miracles happening at the Radisson Hotel. Yeah, that's where I usually go for miracles. Um, but he, he rented a little place in the Radisson, and I, saw, I thought, I'm going to go there and check it out. I'm just going to be a fly in the wall and sit in the back. And um, here are my observations. Number one, it wasn't a very inspired worship. And my guess is if the worship wasn't inspired, I question what's the purpose The next thing is when he started actually into his teaching time. The first thing he said here was, I'm ready to raise people from the dead here tonight. Did anyone bring a corpse with them? You think I'm kidding, don't you? I was in the back and, you know, before I had little red flags going up in my head. And now I'm like, hello, there's something really wrong here. He said it with such confidence, he made it seem like, I raise people from the dead all the time. All you need to do is prove it. Bring me a corpse and I'll raise them. Of course, he knew very well in this country, you just don't carry bodies around with you. So at that point, I'm starting to get a little irritated with this guy. Can you imagine? Then he went through a whole laundry list of things. Anyone here have cancer? Anyone here have diabetes? Anyone here have you know, broken limbs? It you know, goes on this whole laundry list. No one's saying, me, 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 me. Finally, he gets to the point where anyone just have any aches and pains? And this one uh, uh, older lady in the front said, mm, yeah, yeah. And he said, oh, come up here, come up here, and put a mic in her face as if you need to do that in prayer. Do you really need to make a public spectacle? And she said, well, you know, my back's a little sore. My knees ache a little bit. And, you know, I kind of got this little pinch in my shoulder. And he prays over, him, over her really loudly over the mic as if it's everyone's business, right? And then said, so, have you been healed? How do you feel now? Well, you know, I, I, I guess I'm okay. Hallelujah! As if it was a major miracle just happened. And those were examples of emotional button pushing, okay? If we are serving the holy God of the universe, we don't need to push any buttons. All we need to do is say, Lord, you are the one. I'll just be happy to witness what you're doing. one of the things that you need to realize is there may be charlatans out there, but that doesn't mean God doesn't do his work. Second thing we really need to think about today is how does Jesus heal now? How does Jesus operate today? First of all, Jesus operates in the same way that he, that he always did, of course. But we now live in an era where mainly a lot of the physical ailments today are so easily cured or treated would have been absolutely devastating 2,000 years ago. Do you see, can you see where I'm going with this? That if you have uh, some major physical ailments, uh, diseases or something, 
uh, in the time of Jesus, healing would be like the ultimate kind of miracle. Today, I also believe that Jesus can use technology and other people as well. I, I, I don't deny that. I don't deny that a bit. But at the time of Jesus, the physical healing was about the only thing that was really drawn into full focus. But I think nowadays we can take our healing much more as a whole. I do believe that Jesus can definitely heal people from physical harm, from physical things of the body. I've seen it happen. Oh my goodness, I could write a book. I could write a book of um, where God has used, I got to witness God as I lay my hands on people and they can walk when they couldn't have done more than hobble in the past. I, I, could, I could tell you amazing stories of how God is so good and faithful. But also, we have to also understand that it's not just physical healing. Sometimes it's emotional healing. Sometimes we are emotionally broken and we need healing in that respect. Sometimes it's spiritual healing. Sometimes we are so spiritually broken, the only thing we can do is come before the Lord. You mind if I tell you a story? Um, when I was still in seminary, I was pastoring three little churches, part-time churches, three churches, and it was still only three-quarter time. And... Um, I, I got a definite feeling from the Lord that I needed to enter into this uh, healing ministry to teach, to talk about and pray for healing. Believe me, I talked to all my seminary professors about, I wanted to make sure that I was on the right track, that I wasn't just kidding myself, and you know, I got plenty of affirmation in everything that I was going to do. And I let people know ahead of time that on this day, we're going to have, uh, we're going to have a service and we're going to talk about healing. In fact, I'm even going to have a time where people would like to receive prayer. I'd be happy to do that. And the day came, and I was a little bit nervous, but pretty good, because I had the, the confidence of what the Lord can do. And at the very first service, remember I pastored three little churches, at the first service, I got there, and it was about two minutes before the church was about ready to start, and I was the only one in the building. Two minutes before, the little girl who was about 11 years old who played the piano showed up along with her mother. So there were three of us leading the service and about uh, just about ready time to start, there were three guys there. And I said basically the kinds of things I'm talking about today. That God can heal us from physical, spiritual, emotional, whatever you have. Don't just live with it. Come before your father who can help. And this guy who was, I'm six foot four, and I was on the first step, about like I was here in that church, and he was still taller than me. He was a big old farmer with huge broad shoulders, his hands the size of baseball mitts. I remember shaking his hand all the time, and my hand, which is pretty big, just got buried in his. And he knelt down, and I just asked the simple question, how would you like me to pray for you today? And he said, and I can recall it exactly word for word, in notation by notation. He said, I said some things to God 20 years ago in the cornfield that I've never been able to forgive myself for. And I can tell you that even before a prayer was formed in my mind, before the words, I should say, the prayer comes from deeper. Before the words were even in my mind, I put my hand on his shoulders and I could feel the presence of the Lord just melt him away. He basically leaned on the rail just for support. We prayed. And uh, his wife, ironically, he is taller than me. And his wife is about five foot, nothing. And she came up to me a couple of weeks later and gave me a great big hug, basically around the waist. She said, thank you, thank you so much. I said, well, what did I do? She says, thank you for bringing my husband back. At that same service, there was another man who came forward. Basically, all three guys came forward. And one of them was a guy who was a leader in the church, very outgoing, extroverted, uh, super good guy. 
And I asked him, well, how can I pray for you? He says, well, my sister died a year and a half ago. Well, I'd only been there 10 months. I didn't even know he had a sister, let alone that, he, that she died, let alone the, that he was burdened by all of this. And we, we just sat and we prayed. We talked and we prayed. And from that point on, instead of just going through the motions, in his own mind, he said, now I feel like I'm free. Just a few weeks later, he, uh, he signed up to be a, a certified lay leader, to be a, a lay speaker, which was an amazing thing. Here we had a guy whose relationship with God was fractured and broken, and he received spiritual healing. He had another guy who had that emotional burden of that guilt and, that, and, the, and the agonizing guilt that he didn't go to see his sister before she died, but he didn't know, and, he li- and she lived states and states away, freed from that guilt. And I'm not going to tell you a whole bunch of stories about physical healings, but um, we were at this, uh, this uh, Bible camp, and we were going through this, this time of healing, and there's this one woman whose uh, knees and ankles were so bad. And she was about my age, but she was just crippled up. And um, we prayed for her. She, and we just said, no, no, stay in your seat, stay in your seat. And we just came over and then prayed for her. She says, I need to kneel down. I just feel like the Spirit's telling me to kneel down. I said, you cannot even walk. How are you going to kneel down? And she bounded up, ran up to the altar and kneeled. The very same night, this woman who I've known for many, many years, and I didn't even know this about her. We were just casual friends, but she always had orthopedic shoes because she had bad feet, and, her, and she said she's never been able to wear sandals in her life. The next day, she came up to me and put her foot in my face and said, look, I'm wearing flip-flops for the first time ever. Now, again, th- those, are, those are small issues, small issues. I've also seen just a glorious things happen. The real thing for us to understand today is how does God operate today? And I would say with our whole person. How does Jesus heal today? It's not just physical, but it's also spiritual. It's also emotional. It's also the the brokenness in our lives. He cares about it. He cares about everything about us. And when we truly realize that he is our heavenly father who aches to do good things for us, if we will ask. If you take a look at the book of James, uh, this is an amazing passage uh, of, of, of how we are to treat this idea of praying for those who are in need. It says, are any among you in trouble? Let them pray. It doesn't even say what kind of trouble, right? Are anyone happy? Well, let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone sick? Let them gather the elders of the church to pray over them, anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well, and the Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for one another so they may be healed. And the prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. What you get from this is not a formula on how to pray with oil in the name of the Lord, but it's the idea that whatever it is going on in your life, God not only only wants to know about it, he wants to help you through it. How are you broken today? How do you need healing? Of your body, your heart, soul. God cares. He really, really does. There's one more point that I want to make sure that we understand, and that is when Jesus heals, there's a purpose. There really is a purpose. The reason I say that is because I had a conversation with someone many, many years ago, early on in my ministry, and I was just talking about healing, this in general, and they said, I don't believe any of that kind of stuff. I tell you, I went to one of those faith healers, they laid hands on me, and guess what? Nothing happened. Nothing happened. 
Um, years later, I had someone else say, oh yeah, we prayed for my mother that she would live, and guess what? She died. I don't believe in the whole works. You can take that God that you're talking about, and well, I won't say exactly what uh, he suggested, uh, but it wasn't pleasant. The whole idea is that we can very easily take a look at God and ask for healing, and then if it doesn't happen, who do we blame? We blame God. It's easy to blame God, I should say. You don't have to, but it's easy to do that. And that comes from a mindset of putting God far too low on the totem pole. You know what I mean? If we are here, God is so much higher, so much greater than we are. Who are we to tell God what to do? Do you see what I mean? You know, I think people have the idea that God is some sort of genie. That if you take your Bible and rub it, you get three magic miracles or something. That's not the way it works. We need to understand that God is God. God is a real person with a real personality, with infinite wisdom and knowledge. And God infinitely knows what's best for us. And just because we want it doesn't mean that it's best for us. True story. (laughs) Happened this week. You know my grandma died, right? It all started a week ago Thursday. And she fell. She was caught by my uncle who happened to be there, but the fall still jarred her significantly. So Thursday night, I went down to Winona, and I spent two or three hours there just holding her hand, talking to her. Do you think it would have been right for me to ask God to heal her? Sure. It would have been fine. We can come before our Heavenly Father and request anything. Are you with me on this so far? There's a couple of steps here, so you need to be with me on this. It's okay to ask God for anything. But the way I know God, if I would have said, Lord, please heal my grandmother, I think God would have probably have said, there's no need. He may have said, there's no need to heal her. She had a great life. She was 96 years old. She went all over the world for Pete's sake. She went everywhere from Japan to the Middle East to Europe to Hawaii all over. She had almost 40 grandchildren and great-grandchildren. She spent up until the last 14 months of her life in her own home. In the last 14 months of her life, ironically, my aunt bought the house that she grew up in, so my, so my grandma actually moved back home with her, uh, to her daughter, my aunt, and lived in her own bedroom. And she died with her family around her. <laughs> Sorry, I got through the first service pretty well. And she died with her family around her. I can almost see God saying, let me take her and heal her forever. And that's okay. It may be that we ask God to do something incredible in our lives and God knowing us, knowing the whole world and the whole universe and the palm of his hand would know, you know, the best thing is not to heal you now, but let you be a witness later. Has anyone here ever heard of Johnny Erickson Tata? Anyone, Johnny Erickson Tata? A few hands out there, yeah. I'm not going to give her life story. I'll just give you a snippet. When she was 17 years old, she went swimming and dove into a pond, and she uh, hit, hit the ground and broke her neck. She was paralyzed from the neck down. Uh, to make a long story very short, she went through a, a period of her life when she was in the hospital begging to die. And she said, if I had the use of my arms, I would have found a way to take my own life. She asked God to heal her many, many times, and nothing happened. When she finally understood that God wasn't to blame in all of this, she has the most beautiful singing voice imaginable. She has many, many albums. 
She's a painter. She paints with a, a, a brush in her mouth. And they're sold all over the world, not because it's a crippled woman's painting. It's because it's really, really good. Not only that, she has a ministry, Johnny and Friends, where she preaches the good news all over the world. She talks about the fact that if it wasn't for this accident, she would not be able to be used in this miraculous way. She often talks about the fact that when she dies and we have our real resurrection, she'll have a body that will last forever. And so what if she doesn't have the use of her body for a few 50 years here on earth compared to eternity? She also starts this ministry called Wheels for the World where she gets uh, broken and beat up wheelchairs from all over, refurbishes them and brings them out to people who can't use it. The Lord used Johnny Erickson Tata her whole life in ways that she could not have seen when she was 17. Was it wrong for God not to heal her? I don't think so. I don't think so. So if you come before the Lord and say, Lord, help me, heal me, and it doesn't happen the way you want, maybe the question you should say is, okay, Lord, what do you want from me? How do you want to use me in my life? Jesus heals for a purpose and for a reason. He didn't heal absolutely every single person that he met, but in every case, there was a reason and they weren't even the same reason. Sometimes he would heal someone and said, tell the world. Another time he'd say, tell nobody. Another time he would heal someone who had never even met or seen. The centurion, the centurion came up to Jesus and said, heal my daughter. And she's miles away. He says, by the time you get there, she'll be fine. Don't worry about it. Another time she healed, uh, uh, he healed uh, uh, Peter's mother-in-law and said, don't tell a single soul until after I'm gone. You see, you can't put the Lord God into a formula. You can't put him into a box. You can't say this equals this. If you do it in this way, this is the result you will have. It doesn't work that way because God is all-knowing, all-loving, and so eager to bring the most fullness into our lives as possible. And you remember the story of Lazarus. Well, this is just a little snippet of the story that is the most important. But just to bring everyone up to speed, uh, Jesus got the message that Lazarus was dying. Jesus delayed for three days to make sure he was really dead. Then he shows up. And then everyone's saying, Lord, Lord, if you'd only have showed up earlier, he'd still be alive today. And then he comes to the tomb and he says, roll the stone away. And they say, you have no idea. He's been in there a few days. Uh, he's getting a little bit ripe. And Jesus, well, you know, read it for yourself. I'm putting it mildly. And so they roll the stone away. And this is what Jesus says to the crowd. Then Jesus looked up uh, and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know I've known that you always hear me. But I say this for the benefit of the people standing here that they may know that you sent me why did Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead is it for Lazarus' sake no Lazarus was raised from the dead and a few years later he died again fact what good would that have done except for a little brief moment but Jesus had a better plan in mind. He says, Lord, I do this so the people around me will see this and know that you sent me. And guess what? We're still talking about it today. We are still talking about the glory and the riches of Jesus Christ today through that act so Jesus knows exactly what he's doing. And if Jesus doesn't do everything we want him to do, maybe we ought to take the back seat and say, Lord, you have the driver's seat. What do you want out of my life? How do you want to make me whole? Last thing about Johnny Erickson Tata. She was used greatly in her life. And when she was praying that the Lord would take her home, finally the Lord said, Johnny, I have a better use for you. The real question I want to ask you today is, 
How do you plan on getting closer and closer to Jesus, even today? I have to tell you, you have every right as a child of God coming to our Almighty Father and saying, Lord, heal my body, heal my heart, heal the deepest reaches of my soul. Sometimes he'll just smile down at us and say, oh, my dear child, I've been waiting for you. I've been waiting for you just to ask, to show my glory to you in a way that would be unmistakable. Hmm. But the goal, of course, is that we take a few more steps closer to him. In just a couple of minutes, I'm going to ask everyone to come forward for communion, for communion. And when you come forward today and you rip off a piece of the bread and you dip it in the cup, and I'm going to ask you to literally come before the cross of Christ. As you come before the Lord on your knees today, this would be a great opportunity for you to say, Lord, I'd love for you to do a work in my life. I would love for you to change me, to make me whole, to make me usable for you for the rest of my life. And when we're done here today, if anyone would like me to sit and pray with you, oh, I'd be happy to. I would love to. And all I would ask is that you come to the front and uh, without all the crowds, without the microphones, just two people asking our Father to do something great. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, as we come to you today, oh, we thank you. Oh, we praise you. We rejoice in you and we lift you up on high. And Lord, as we come to you today, we know that your power, your love, and your grace is so immense that you can do an amazing thing here today. And Lord, I would pray that as the people come forward on their knees to the foot of the cross, that you would not only hear their prayer, but you would be that still small voice of the Holy Spirit to nudge us all into a place where we see you. Lord, let that be true both now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen.